So good afternoon, but also good morning and good evening to everyone. I'm Roberta Solis, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to another webinar of the Global Judicial Integrity Network, an initiative of UNODC's Global Program for the Implementation of the Doha Declaration, and a platform of judges and for judges to provide support in strengthening judicial integrity worldwide. The virtual event of today is co-organized by the UNODC Global Judicial Integrity Network, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, and the National School of Magistrates of Brazil, ENFAM, on the occasion of the 30th session of the UN Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, also known as the CCPCJ. The Global Judicial Integrity Network continues to work on the priority topics identified by its participants and that constitute new challenges for judges and jurisdictions across regions. With this initiative, the network aims to broaden the opportunities for networking and knowledge exchange, in particular during this period in which in-person sessions cannot be organized. Before introducing our panel of experts of today, I would like to give the floor to the coordinator of the Global Program for the Implementation of the Doha Declaration, Mr. Marco Teixeira, who would also like to greet the audience of our webinar and side event to the CCPCJ. Marco, you have the floor. Obrigado, Roberta. Thank you, Roberta, for setting the stage and contextualizing what we are doing here and a good afternoon to all the participants from the different time zones, but good afternoon from Vienna. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Marco Teixeira, as Roberta mentioned, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our section on judicial well-being and its implications for access to justice and judicial integrity. And as Roberta mentioned, we are very happy to organize this in partnership with the National School of Magistrates of Brazil, and also with the UN Special Rapporteur on Independence of Judges and Lawyers, my dear friend, dear Garcia Sainé. And also I'd like to appreciate and to thank our speakers of today for their willingness to share with us their perspectives, visions and experiences. We're looking forward to hear from you. The DOA Global Programme, the programme that I lead, aims to support the Member States through various thematic activities, including the important work on strengthening judicial integrity. And it's under that umbrella and that framework that we have launched the Global Judicial Integrity Network, which is basically the initiative that is also co-organizing this event. It's widely recognized that judges need to be performing of the utmost of their abilities to guarantee that justice is served, which means that they are key and it's key to consider measures to ensure judicial well-being. This was even noted in the commentary of the Bangalore Principles when it mentions, and I'm quoting, a judge should have sufficient time to permit the maintenance of, of physical and mental well-being. I think this maintenance is crucial from our perspective because, because their professional roles, uh, judge can obviously have carrying and carry an immense responsibility. They make life-changing decisions for citizens. For that purposes, their well-being is a key to maintain a solid and um, rational approach to the decision they will take. It's for us and our perspective, judges are key part of functioning of the communities and obviously to also address challenges and keeping up their mental well-being is essential. In addition to the usual challenges, Many of the member states have considered members of the judiciary as essential workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. That created an additional um, challenge and obviously additional difficulties to work and continue to work during the pandemic context. Accordingly with WHO, fear, worries and stress are all additional pressures to individuals and judges continue to be individuals and they feel the same pressures as all of us in our different roles. As many of you know, the Global Judicial Integrity Network has been trying since its inception to identify challenges that are faced by judges and judiciaries worldwide and create a space for discussing and addressing those challenges. 
And today is another initiative under that scope. Among others, the network has published guidance, materials on use of social media by judges, gender-related judicial integrity issues, and obviously the development and implementation of codes of conduct, and obviously judicial ethics dimension and trainings. The network has been promoted opportunities and will continue to promote opportunities for dialogue and experience sharing, such through the publications of written opinions, production of podcast episodes by judging and expect experts, and moreover, the network has organized various conferences and events okay. in different sizes and shapes to ensure that we can continue to clo be close to judges and also yeah. try to find common solutions for their challenges. During the pandemic, we continue that path in the spirit of the network vision to continue to cooperate and support is this the spirit of this section that judicial well-being is also an important aspect of delivering justice and obviously deserves all our full attention. Uh, I would like to mention also the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres when he said, and I'm quoting, mental health has been neglected for too long. It concerns all of us and greater actions are urgent. We need strong investments in services and we must allow stigma and must allow not stigma to push people away from the assistance they need. From our side, from the Global Judicial Integrity Network, we'll continue to call in our partners to work together to for sure break down the stigma and promote the well-being among the judicial community. I look forward to hear from all of you, from our distinguished panelists, how they have been working and supporting the judicial well-being, their own jurisdictions, and also we can learn from their experiences and obviously to continue to share experience among ourselves. So without further ado, I'll give I'll give back the floor back to you. Roberta, without uh, also mentioning my appreciation to our judicial integrity team, fantastic team, Roberta, Tatiana, Melissa and Christina, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Have a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, for your support today. And as always, through the activities of the Global Judicial Integrity Network, it has been truly a great pleasure to work with you in the global program. In the webinar of today, we will explore the topic of judicial well-being and its implications for access to justice and judicial integrity, the experiences and new challenges arising from the global pandemic. And that is because holding a judicial position can be extremely stressful, demanding and isolating. Moreover, judges are faced with heavy workloads, tight schedules, and often also with various systematic challenges, outside pressures and unfounded criticism. The global pandemic has only made the topic even more pressing, since it has caused additional emotional and physical burdens on judges and has created new challenges to the functioning of the judiciary. All of this can take its toll on the physical and mental well-being of judges, which is not only of serious harm to the judges at the personal level, but can also have a detrimental effect on public trust in the judiciary, judicial integrity, ethics, and access to justice. So for this purpose, uh, this webinar will feature a high-level panel of judges and members of the judiciary from across the world that will share with us the strategies and mechanisms that judiciaries could implement to provide the necessary support to judges to handle the stress and difficulties that accompany their work and life as judges, including in light of the ongoing pandemic. We hope that the session will shed additional light on and advocate for increased attention to the topic of judges' resilience and well-being and contribute to the efforts of UNODC's Global Judicial Integrity Network to assist judiciaries in addressing existing and emerging challenges to judicial integrity through its various activities. Therefore, and again, without further ado, allow me to present the excellent members of our panel today, who with their extensive experience and knowledge will guide us through this topic. So our panel today has uh, Ms. Sally Ryan and Ms. Carly Schriever, Judicial Wellbeing Advisors of the Judicial College of Victoria, Australia. 
Honorable Justice Luciani Munch, uh, Chief Judge for Internal Affairs at the Federal Justice of the Fourth Region and member of the National School of Magistrates of Brazil. The Honorable Justice Mary Rose Girty, Judge of the High Court and Director of Judicial Studies in Ireland. And the Honorable Diego Garcia Sayan, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers and member of the Advisory Board of the Global Judicial Integrity Network. Dear panelists, thank you very much for being with us today, sharing all, with all of the participants of the network your recommendations and practices. So we'll start the discussion by asking a specific question to each of the panelists then ask another question to all of the panelists to encourage discussion. And finally, the debate will be opened to the public through the webinar chat function. So for all of the participants, please use the chat function to uh, write your questions. We will not open the floor for questions from the audience, but rather have your questions from the chat function. And also thanks to all of the participants very much in advance for following the rules of participation by please keeping your microphone silent and your cameras off during the webinar to guarantee the quality of the audio. To our panelists, please do turn on your cameras uh, when you're speaking. So I'll start our session with Ms. Sally Ryan and Ms. Carly Shriver of Australia. And since they will be presenting together, I will read both of their questions. And then when they finish their joint presentation, I will ask the questions to the other members of the panel. So, uh, Ms. Carly Shriver, uh, in view of your work in such a path-breaking position as Judicial Wellbeing Advisor, could you tell us more about how judicial stress can manifest itself and why judicial well-being is so important? And in particular, could you explain how the pandemic has impacted judicial well-being? Now to Ms. Sally Ryan, uh, you're also a judicial uh, well-being advisor. So could you share with us, please, some experiences of your judicial college in terms of prevention, management, and response to judicial stress? So what are some of the strategies to support judicial well-being? So Ms. Ryan, Ms. Shriver, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta, and also Marco for those opening remarks. I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, I'd like to begin, as we always do in Australia, by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we are meeting on. For Sally and I in Melbourne in Australia, we are meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And for the rest of you, hopefully you will know whose traditional lands you are meeting on. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to Indigenous peoples everywhere. It's important to articulate at the start of a panel discussion such as this that it is only very recently that the global judicial community has been willing to speak about judicial stress. For centuries it was taboo to suggest that judicial officers might be subject to the same human experiences as the rest of us. In fact, 20 years ago in Australia, judicial stress was referred to by one very senior judge as the unmentionable topic. It has become more mentionable in recent years, but it remains a topic that most judges want to treat with some caution. There are good reasons both for the greater willingness to acknowledge and talk about judicial stress and for the ongoing sensitivity around the topic, which perhaps we can discuss in the Q&A. But for context, I think it is important to emphasise that this discussion of judicial stress stands on the shoulders of several decades of high quality empirical research on lawyer stress from around the world, which has really put beyond doubt, I think, the scope and magnitude of the mental health problem within the legal profession globally. This overwhelming evidence of stress and mental ill health among lawyers begs the question, to what extent does this problem extend to the most senior members of the legal profession, judicial officers? The final thing I wanna say by way of introduction is that this topic of judicial stress can stir things up for us. For judges listening to this conversation, it may focus your mind on some of the tough times you have had or are having in office. If anything in this panel discussion raises issues for you, I encourage you to speak to somebody, whether it be a trusted colleague, a family member, or a professional. Okay, so how does judicial stress manifest? There are many ways we could approach this question, but I want to approach it by sharing with you some of the findings of my recent PhD research on judicial stress and wellbeing in Australia, <coughs> which involved 152 judicial officers from five Australian courts and sought to answer these three questions. What is the nature, prevalence and severity of judicial stress? 
are judicial officers stressed compared to lawyers in the general population? And if so, which judicial officers are most stressed and why? Although this is Australian research, when I have presented the findings internationally before, judges from around the world have frequently said that they feel that the findings resonate with their experience and that they expect similar results would be found if the research were conducted in their country. Um, and I'd be interested in what you think um, as I take you through the findings. What I found is that judicial stress manifests in a range of ways. Firstly, non, what we call non-specific psychological distress, which refers to generalised stress, not necessarily amounting to mental illness. So feeling irritable, feeling rushed, feeling worked up, low, overwhelmed. Judicial officers' rates of non-specific psychological distress were elevated compared to barristers and the general population, but lower than lawyers and law students. Judicial stress also manifests as burnout, which is a debilitating condition specifically linked to high workloads and prolonged interpersonal demands. It's characterised by high emotional exhaustion, high cynicism or loss of meaning, and reduced professional efficacy. In my study, 75% of judicial officers had scores indicating some level of burnout risk, and there were 4% that scored in the highest risk range. I also found that judicial stress can manifest as secondary traumatic stress, which refers to the development of PTSD-like symptoms of avoidance, intrusion, uh, intrusion and arousal as a result of, be, of the repeated exposure to information and material relating to the traumatic experiences of others. 30% of judicial officers in my study scored in the range warranting uh, formal assessment for PTSD which is a rate comparable to several groups of social workers in the US, where, which had used the same scale in, in those studies, but dramatically higher than the population prevalence of PTSD. So my research, in my research at least, it appears that judicial stress generally manifests as some combination of non-specific psychological distress, burnout, and secondary traumatic stress, but interestingly, not as a widespread mental health problem. Judicial officers' rates of depression, anxiety and clinically significant stress were um, slightly lower than the general population, which is dramatically lower than what has been found for lawyers. So in a nutshell, in Australia at least, there is not yet a widespread mental health problem among judicial officers, but there is a stress problem. And burnout and secondary trauma are prominent features of the judicial stress experience. What I also found is that it's judicial officers in the high volume lower courts in Australia, that's the magistrates, that experience significantly higher levels of stress than judges in the trial and appellate courts. I found no differences in stress levels as a function of age, gender, seniority, location, or even area of practice. Jurisdiction was the sole demographic variable associated with, with judicial stress. This for me was a significant and somewhat unexpected finding because most of the commentary on judicial stress has tended to emphasise case content, in particular criminal and family matters, as the major source of stress for judges. My findings suggest that it's less about case content and more about the judicial working environment, in particular workload and administrative support. And the good news there, as Sally will talk about a bit later, is that if it's about the environment, we can do something about it. Why is judicial stress important? This has already been touched on by Marco at the start of, um, of this panel discussion, but I think it's important at three levels. It's of course important for judicial officers because stress undermines the psychological and physical health of the person experiencing it. But I think it's also important for court users, including litigants, legal professionals and court staff, because we know that stress undermines our capacities for emotion regulation and impulse control which make it more likely that we'll behave in ways that we regret or that, are, that cause problems for others. And judicial wellbeing is also important, I think, for the integrity of judicial decisions, because we know from a whole host of research that's been done in human decision-making that stress undermines our objectivity and our critical thinking, leading to more stereotypical and conservative decisions and decisions that preserve the status quo. And just to very briefly illustrate this point, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this rather famous study of parole decision makers in Israel, it's now 10 years old, which found that parole was significantly more likely to be granted at the start of the working day, after morning tea and after lunch. Uh, and as the decision makers became more fatigued and depleted of blood sugar um, between break times, they were increasingly likely to make the conservative status quo decision of denying parole. Now, finally, before I hand over to my colleague, Sally, 
How has the pandemic in impacted judicial wellbeing? In addition to the manifold ways that the pandemic has impacted the wellbeing of almost every human on the planet, there are several impacts that I think are particular to judicial work because working from home or conducting hearings online has removed many of the unconscious and incidental wellbeing supports that were in place for judges pre-pandemic. Role clarity uh, refers to knowing what is within the scope of your role and also recognising that it is our role and not our, our full human selves that legitimises the, the exercising of judicial power. So, for example, if you're sentencing someone, it's helpful psychologically to do that as Judge Jones, not Janet Jones. Under, under ordinary circumstances, there's much in place to support role clarity, the architecture of the courtroom, the robes that you might wear, the modes of addressing court, uh, the way that the courtroom is opened at the start of a hearing. And unconsciously, all of these, um, unconsciously and implicitly, all of this helps you get into role. Under current circumstances for many of us, um, pressure is being put on role clarity. Many of you are having to manage proceedings either in your home or online. The boundaries between work and home have become blurred. Many judges are having to, bris to bring distressing case material into their homes and having to establish and maintain the authority of the courtroom over technology. None of this is easy. Role enjoyment is also a protective factor against occupational stress. And by role enjoyment, I'm not just talking about pleasure and fun, but about engagement, meaning and purpose. Even if work is very demanding and difficult, if we find it satisfying and meaningful, we're able to keep going and even source enjoyment from the challenges. But under current circumstances, pressure is put on role enjoyment. Uh, judges are less able to see their colleagues and interact with the profession. Trial work and jury management, which might have perhaps been the parts of the work that you found most meaningful, um, are often not available or not available in the same way. And there is perhaps a, a bit of grief and loss over um, experiencing the mastery and professional efficacy that you once had in the role. Um, even being present in court, the visibility of the role, the energising atmosphere of the courtroom, these are things that are not as available as they once were. And um, for some of us working from home, um, even just being in a different environment to home. Then, of course, there's isolation, which um, is already a well-documented stressor of judicial work, has been exacerbated under COVID conditions. Screen fatigue, conducting hearings online is cognitively much more draining in person, uh, sorry, than in person. Um, and many judges and magistrates are sitting with the ever-growing sense of exhausted dread about the tsunami of cases that await courts on the other side of this. So definitely the sources of stress for judicial officers are ramped up within the pandemic uh, and it's important to think about how we manage them. So um, I'll hand over now to my colleague, Sally. And, Thanks. Uh, thank you, Carly. Um, and thank you also to Roberta and Marco for that lovely warm welcome. Just a reminder, everyone, I am answering a question um, about sharing the experience of the, of the Judicial College in terms of how we prevent, manage and respond to ju judicial stress. So really, I'm going to be speaking about some of the strategies that can support judicial wellbeing. And the Judicial College supports Victorian courts and judicial officers with strategies on three different levels, prevention, management and response. And these strategies have been developed over the last six years. They haven't, haven't happened quickly and um, they have involved building a culture of increasing openness and trust to discuss stress and wellbeing in the, the judiciary. The work's certainly not finished in Victoria and I'm looking forward to learning more tonight, although I think we have come a long way in six years. So the strategies I'm going to talk to you about um, and describe reflect a belief that we have that judicial well-being is a mutual responsibility between the courts as systems and individual judicial, judicial officers. And you can see in this graphic that there are three levels, as I said, and I'm going to describe strategies at each of these levels from a systems perspective and also an individual perspective. So thinking about prevention, and firstly, systemic prevention. So prevention strategies are the things that we can do to um, stop judicial officers experiencing some stress. And as Carly said, some of that she alluded earlier, some of that is about actually changing um, structures within courts and changing workflows within courts. Some examples of how we've attempted to do this in Victoria are through creating court wellbeing strategies 
And in doing that, we have um, systemically and systematically identified risks to judicial wellbeing and to staff wellbeing. And once these risks are identified, we have put in place um, plans that have managed people's exposure to those risks. And through, through those other strategies emerge. And um, an important part of these strategies is, is education, so judicial education and awareness raising. And I'd say that at the education level, the program, um, the programs that are run by the Judicial College are certainly um, opportunities for judicial officers to come together and, and speak and create this um, developing culture of openness. Another important strategy at the systems level is supporting judicial leaders and the role that judicial leadership plays in preventing stress. We know that um, judicial leaders have an important part to play in understanding current stressors and, and certainly that the pandemic has been an opportunity for leaders, not just heads of jurisdiction, but leaders throughout courts to understand and really um, really listen to the, the current stressors that we've all been going through. They have a role to role model wellbeing and to bring people together to speak. And as Carly spoke about earlier, to really promote role clarity. And of course, this has been more challenging during the pandemic. On an individual level, what, what can individual judi judicial officers do to um, prevent judicial stress? Well, we tend to think about this as um, being an important part is having a wellbeing plan. So this is an idea that each individual judicial officer could develop a wellbeing plan for themselves that is created at a time when um, one is not, not as stressed, when it's not a crisis, but actually as a preventative structure. And we use the word holistic because we think it's really important that all aspects of the self are included here, but socially, through emotional expression, through attending to physical health, by thinking of strategies that help one to stay intellectually or cognitively engaged. And most importantly, a real thoughtful approach to um, being clear about one's meaning, purpose and direction in not only um, one's career, but uh, how that actually fits with, with, um, with your life, life path. So we encourage judicial officers in Victoria to have one of those plans. Sorry, Carly, I'm jumping backwards and forwards. The management level. So the management level really means how we can respond to stress that is an intrinsic part of the role. There are some aspects of the judicial role that are highly complex and challenging that actually just need to be managed. We know that, um, that there are day-to-day -day challenges that need to be thought through. And on a systemic level, some of the initiatives that have been put in place in Victoria to respond to these, these um, ongoing stressors are programs like um, proactive wellbeing supervision. A proactive wellbeing supervision program is a program that's in place in a number of jurisdictions in Victoria and involves being able to access four sessions a year with a psychologist to look at the wellbeing plan that I spoke about earlier, to reflect on the last couple of months and how challenges have been managed and plan ahead for new strategies to um, support, support the judicial officer over the coming months. We also have uh, access to critical incident debriefing, which is very important in um, helping to reduce the accumulation of stress that can happen through critical incidents that occur in court or outside of court. We also have a judicial peer support program, which builds on the important collegiate relationships that we know are absolutely critical for judicial officers. So this is an education program that we um, have developed at the college where judicial officers learn about how to recognise the signs of distress or stress in a colleague, and then how to have a proactive, supportive and safe conversation with a colleague who might be struggling. Then if we think about what individuals can do at the management level, so what sort of strategies can individual judicial officers learn to help manage the day-to-day -day stressors? Some of the things that 
uh, our judicial officers have been learning about uh, strategies to regulate emotions, such as um, breathing, grounding techniques, strategies that can be used to manage the emotional experience of the work. We talk about how to manage empathic responses, which is critical when you're looking at uh, graphic or traumatic material, and also strategies to monitor self-talk, which is important um, to manage the critic within us all and to help focus on satisfying and, and competence enhancing aspects of our role. The last part of the responses that we've put in place in Victoria are, are ones that really attend to acute response. And the, the bedrock of those is having a, a terrific professional support program. And in Victoria, we've called this the Judicial Officers Assistance Program. And this is um, a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, counselling program staffed by highly experienced psychologists who understand the work of the judiciary and courts and um, is something that is really important to be able to access for judicial officers if they're having challenges inside the judicial role and stress there or challenges outside of the work role and particularly when those two collide and certainly that's been the case over the last year. We've all been under, under pressures in, in both aspects of our, our work and um, home lives. The other aspect of the acute response that we, we'd like to highlight is the importance of the collegiate and peer network for judicial officers. And that it's very important to um, have relationships and collegiate connections where you understand and know each other well enough to recognise signs of of distress and be able to confidently reach out and um, have conversations with colleagues, which sometimes end up in um, connecting people with the professional supports that are available. So what we know from, from our research and particularly Carly's research and our experience of it in Victoria is that judicial stress is an ine inevitable aspect of a challenging and very satisfying role. We know that it really becomes more problematic when it's unacknowledged and unmanaged. And we've seen that responding to judi judicial stress starts with a full and frank conversation. And Carly and I see this conversation today or tonight as it is for us and in the morning as it is for some of you as a really significant step for the global judicial community. And we're, we're really thrilled to be part of this, this conversation with you all. Thank you. That's Carly and my answer to our questions. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. These are indeed uh, very interesting points that you raise. I think you really set the tone for, for the discussions today uh, with all of these relevant issues and all the elements to be taken uh, into account. So thanks for sharing the experience and giving us such practical and concrete examples. And on a side note, uh, maybe to mention that, uh, Ms. River, the Israeli study that you referenced, uh, we also mentioned this in, uh, in the Global Judicial Integrity Network's judicial ethics training tools, in particular in our e-learning course, as an example of research showing how the various uh, factors that can influence a judge's impartiality, for example. So it, it, it's interesting to see you also mentioned in, in your presentation. So continuing with our panel, I will now turn to Justice uh, Munch of Brazil. Uh, Justice Luciani Munch, uh, in your roles uh, as a chief judge for internal affairs and as a member of the National School of Magistrates of Brazil, could you explain to us how judicial well-being implicates judicial ethics and integrity and the principles set out in the Bangalore Principles of Judicial Conduct, as well as what is the role of judicial training in this regard? Thank you, and the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Roberta and Marco, for your welcome. And Carly and Sally, I am amazed by the systemic, holistic approach to judicial well-being that you have developed, and I look forward to knowing more about it. Um, I would like to break my answer into two parts. Firstly, I will address how judicial well-being implicates judicial ethics and integrity and the principles set out in the Bangalore Principles of Judicial Conduct. Secondly, the role of judicial training in this regard. 
Integrity is one of the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct. As such, it is considered to be essential to the proper discharge of the judicial office. A judge's conduct impacts not only the perception people might have of him or her individually, but also the perception they might have of the judiciary as a whole. The commentary to the principles states that integrity is the attribute of rectitude and righteousness, whose components are honesty and judicial morality. But how does this relate to well-being? Initially, it is known that stress and burnout negatively impact human health, affecting impulse control, decision-making and emotion regulation capacities. Such impact on judges can impair their ability to issue unbiased, good quality decisions with harmful consequences for people's lives and the community. Moreover, the judicial function is in itself stressful, which calls for awareness of the matter of judicial well-being and enhances the need to promote it. All this is in line with the Bangalore commentary stating that in the judiciary, integrity is a necessity. As such, it follows that judicial institutions, including judicial schools, must be aware of and work actively to promote judicial well-being. They have a duty towards society in this regard. And this leads me to the second question. In relation to the role of judicial training in promoting well-being and consequently securing judicial integrity, I would like to recall the origin of the word integrity that comes from the Latin integer, whole. Integrity means wholeness, and for me, judicial being is about wholeness. Wholeness is, in my view, a process of reconciling all our dimensions as human beings as sons and daughters, sisters, brothers, friends, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers. Wholeness is reminding that even though we perform a judicial function, our lives are not reduced to it, that we still can marvel at the sunset or at a full moon up in the sky, that we have many emotions, that we can laugh and cry, that we dream. Wholeness is a process that comes from inside. We are people. Integrity, thus, comes first in relation to ourselves. Integrity is about reconciling inside us all what we are. It is about bringing the human in us to our functions, about being kind to ourselves to be able to be kind to our communities. From this point of view, I would like to note the permanent potential of judicial training to boost well-being by means of incorporating a humanist approach to education. With this approach, judicial training can go beyond pure legal education and play a role in helping judges find their wholeness, their integrity towards themselves, and consequently towards their communities. Within this perspective, the pedagogical project of the Brazilian National Judicial School, ENFA, reflects, and I quote, an integral view of the judge, which presents itself as a result of the school's humanistic perspective. In this regard, Enfan recognized that in the same way that judges must take human aspects into consideration in their decisions, judicial educators must also incorporate the human aspects of judicial work in their pedagogical projects. In all the school's courses, judicial trainers must use active learning methodologies to develop competencies and interpersonal skills so as to foster autonomy, creativity, critical thinking, cooperation, solidarity, social responsibility, and integration. Reproducing real-life situations, trainers make judges feel the emotions of people appearing before their courts, emotions to which they, the judges, can relate. The training's dynamics, on the other hand, also create an environment for judges to build new relationships or strengthen older ones, which also helps counter judicial isolation. All these training methodologies stimulate empathy, engagement, resilience, sense of purpose and meaning. Giving judges opportunities to thrive, not only in their intellectual capacity, but especially as human beings. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention and I remain available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Justice uh, Munch. Uh, and it's it's very interesting to learn about the experience of the National Judicial School uh, of Brazil. 
and I think that what you presented on treating judges uh, in a holistic approach as human beings, I think it's really at the core of what we are discussing here uh, today. So thank you very much. I will now turn to Justice uh, Mary Rose Gerty of Ireland. So Justice uh, Gerty, you have set up a working group in Ireland on judicial well-being and for putting in place measures to support judges in conducting their duties. Could you then share with us uh, your experience with this and what lessons do you have from this process and what further uh, important measures uh, you see as necessary? Thank you so much and the floor is yours. Thank you, Roberta, and thank you all for taking time out today to listen to this conversation. It's a very timely one. I should start by saying good morning, Brazil. Good afternoon from Ireland and good night to Sally and Carly in Australia. It's very exciting to be in a group uh, that literally spans the world. Um, we've, a, we've a short time frame, so I'm going to make this a very uh, a whistle stop tour, actually, is the quickest way to deal with this question. Um, this is an exciting time in Ireland because we have a brand new uh, judicial council and one of the projects of the council has been to set up a working group on well-being. It's chaired by Miss Justice Marie Baker of our Supreme Court and when she was unexpectedly required elsewhere because we're all so resilient on this uh, group, I stepped in and that's why I'm here. I'm the director of training at the moment in, uh, in Ireland, but again, that's quite a new post. So we have lots of lessons learned that we're very happy to share with you. So I'm going to stay with that tour language because the first lesson we have learned is this. When you're having a tour towards wellness, you need to pick your traveling companions carefully. So wellness is a much more uh, popular topic, if I can put it that way, but we've just heard from Carly in particular that traditionally perhaps judges weren't necessarily going to be the first to admit that they might suffer from stress or anything like it. But there are some judges always who are more open to this kind of a discussion and more enthusiastic about this topic than others. They're the traveling companions you want on a committee that is uh, going to deal with these issues because some, as, you, as we all know, will, will be more interested in the topic than others. So that was our first lesson. Pick your traveling companions carefully. Uh, the next lesson is to get a map. As if you're going on any tour or trip, you need to know where you're going. And what I mean by that in this context is to do a survey of the ground around you. Ask your colleagues, what do you need in this area? It's the equivalent effectively of a training needs assessment. So get a sense of where your institution is at present before launching into plans that may not be appropriate or may indeed be unwelcome. That not only focuses your work as a committee, this is advice for anyone really in a startup, but it means that your colleagues have a sense of ownership of the programme. So you raise awareness of the issue by doing a survey and you give your colleagues a sense that they're in part of this journey and that they have an influence on it. And that always means that they will be more engaged with, with whatever programme you put in place. So you have your travelling companions, you've created a, a map of sorts, you've done a survey of the terrain. The next lesson is not to walk before you can run, or at least, sorry, walk before you can run. Uh, don't attempt everything too quickly. So anyone who's enthusiastic about anything knows what happens if you start running before you can walk and um, you fall over. Uh, much as I like that experience, it's a bit of fun, particularly if you're skiing, actually. I've only done that once in my life and I loved the sense of I'm learning how to do this. I definitely shouldn't be on this hill and I've fallen over again. That's fine in the snow, not so good in any other context. So um, and I never went back. I'm not sure what kind of a life lesson that is for anybody. So let's not let's not dwell on that. But um, we learned that uh, we had to take relatively small steps uh, at the beginning. So we've focused on new judges. We have focused on well-being and induction for new judges, and we focused on mentoring. We have an or had an informal mentoring scheme in Ireland, but. Uh, we have made it much more formal and we focus on resilience and collegiality and well-being as part of that mentoring programme. So we've started small, in other words, with all of the new judges coming in and gradually our plans are to extend that across the judiciary. So a general mentoring scheme, not just for those who are coming in as new judges. Um, 
the other lesson, and, and this is my favourite, I must say, is if you want to travel a bit faster, now you've started walking with perhaps uh, smaller plans, you you want to grow, you want the whole programme to become more embedded and, and more widespread, uh, so you want to travel faster. Don't reinvent the wheel. You're surrounded by colleagues. And in fact, I've just met two new colleagues in this area, two new guides, Carly and Sally. And I will certainly be looking for their slides in this context. So we learned very quickly, don't reinvent the wheel. We contacted our nearest neighbours in Northern Ireland, in England and in Scotland, and we have had fantastic support from all of their uh, from our colleagues there, the Judicial College in England and Wales and the Judicial Institute in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, the, all of our colleagues have been magnificent. And they, of course, have uh, uh, certainly in, in at least uh, one case in particular, very well developed programme, but in other areas, they have been extremely helpful to us in uh, sharing materials and advising us as to how they uh, put in place similar programmes. So that's that's a, that has been a very useful lesson. Um, other judiciaries have excellent programmes. Communication with other judges is absolutely vital, not just to learn what they're doing, but as you know, it enhances our well-being as it does for all of us to have contact with our colleagues and to discuss our various challenges. So in this context, not only is it is it great for setting up a programme, but of course it's it's great for your general well-being. Um, the other uh, lesson, I suppose, in this regard is to keep talking on your journey, keep that contact uh, regular, keep communicating with others, um, and that, of course, builds on not just your programme, but but your own uh, sense of well-being. Um, at, at, our, at our most basic, I think, and it was confirmed by Carly's figures just there, uh, we have linked the number of judges with the uh, stresses uh, and the level of stress in the job. So in particular, I, what Carly said about district judges really resonates with me because the, the level of work being undertaken by our, our district court, particularly after the pandemic and during it, I shouldn't say after yet, sadly, but um, the, the workload on, on those judges is utterly huge and the, it has been relentless for over a year now and they're shouldering it really uh, with wonderful resilience but but realistically what is needed in fact is 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 more resources in particular in in those courts it seems to me having done some work in this area now but um anyway at least we're we're live to the issues and can and perhaps uh, can can make the case for, for more assistance in that regard. And I'll just finish by saying, um, in terms of our whistle stop tour, your destination obviously is, we hope, uh, wellness for, for all of the judiciary, wellness for all of our colleagues and, and indeed for all of us. And how will you know when you get there? Well, I can only tell you that um, if w most of you don't know me, so um, I can reveal to you that I'm in my late 70s um, and I'm genuinely devoted to wellness and uh, promoting resilience and I practice what I preach. So you can see how amazing I look. So if you uh, renew your determination to focus on your well-being, you can look as good as I do. And I think that's probably going to be the, uh, the lesson, hopefully, that you take away from here today. I'll take any questions later on. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roberta. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justice uh, Gerti. And uh, after this last statement, I think you will also receive additional questions about how you take <laughs> care of yourself. Uh, but also quoting you uh, on uh, choosing your traveling companions. Uh, we do hope that the Global Judicial Integrity Network can also become one of those uh, companions in this uh, long journey for all of the the judiciaries of the world. I'm oh, sure that all the You're stuck with us now, here. Roberta. I can tell you, you're stuck with us now. Yes, you're there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I think it's the other way around. You're now stuck with the network. We have a, a small saying that once you're in, you are a part of the network, and we don't let you go. <laughs> so thank you so much for this very uh, interesting experience and this very practical. Uh, also uh, advice to judiciaries all over the world from the experience of Ireland. So to close the first round of questions from this panel, I will now then ask the following questions to the United Nations Special Rapporteur, uh, Diego Garcia Sayan, to learn more from his also valuable experience. Dear Diego, from your broad experience with judiciaries uh, as well as individual judges, both uh, from your time as the Special Rapporteur, but also as a member and president of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, 
Uh, what do you see as the main causes of judicial stress? What are the additional effects of the ongoing pandemic and how they can be addressed? And any suggestions also to the role of the Global Judicial Integrity Network uh, in this regard? So, Diego, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, Roberta, and it's a pleasure to be here in this panel today. Thank you for the invitation. Of course, there are two, two levels. No? One is what we can call the structural or permanent uh, sources of stress. We have several ones, as some of them have been already mentioned uh, today. But uh, I think especially in, in two of them. One is the huge workload that in, in some countries with uh, lack of uh, financial resources, uh, many judges and prosecutors have to face hearings that are impossible to follow uh, closely, uh, files that in some cases raise to be thousands of, 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 of pages to, of, of e-file, which is uh, mentally and physically very difficult or impossible to follow up. And second, a, a major source of pressure in several countries, hope, hopefully not in all of them, is the pressure of people, groups, of uh, de facto or uh, formal powers to achieve certain kind of results uh, affecting independence of uh, judges, independence uh, of the working of uh, prosecutors. That could be so-called political, that could be called other sort of not uh, regular uh, accesses to judges, so to achieve certain results with, of course, for honest and transparent judges generates a, a source of pressure, which is really not only undue, but obviously a cause of stress. The pandemic has only aggravated all these uh, elements uh, in various aspects. First, I think that I am mentioning uh, in, in one of the aspects of the, the next report that I will present in the General Assembly in October this year is really uh, hundreds of uh, judges, uh, prosecutors, and lawyers that have passed away as a, as a consequence of the pandemic. Many of them, because of they continue their activities in a context in which it was not, uh, from the healthy point of health point of view, advisable. So really, my my honor and homage to 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 all of them. But there are there are many other aspects. For instance, in very few countries, uh, the judicial activity has been uh, considered an essential activity. So uh, the lack of uh, protection, uh, the lack of uh, procedures, so to achieve certain results have led that many, many cases, people had continued to, to work uh, in, in quite uh, unsafe, unsafe conditions. And new challenges that have uh, added to what we can we call the sources of, uh, of, of pressure uh, again uh, on judges, uh, and prosecutors. First, one of them uh, that occurs to me, the, incre the dramatic increase in several countries of violence against women, of feminicides, femicides, in which the first uh, area in which uh, the, the society expects to react is the police and the judges uh, and the prosecutors to act in some way. There is uh, a, a big gap that al already existed, but that right now it has dramatically increased the figures in areas like Latin America are really impressing how uh, uh, domestic violence and violence against women has increased and the scarce possibilities to react timely and appropriately. And then corruption. Corruption that has always been a source of pressure uh, and, uh, and, a, and a major challenge to face uh, in a society that looks to the judges to say, well, I, what you are doing to, to, to face this, uh, these attacks against uh, proper use of uh, uh, public resources, of course, with new budgets, uh, uh, additional and exceptional uh, financial so uh, resources to, com to combat the effects of the pandemic, there has been one major uh, element uh, there that has all generated needs of uh, more action by, by judges. So and we are in a context in which <clears throat> several things have been blocked, new problems has, has achieved, and now some people imagine that, well, at least we have uh, 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 digital networks, internet, and uh, Zooms to have uh, um, to proceed with audiences and some activities in the judiciary. Of course, that's true. 
in a way that has allowed to to to, uh, to continue and uh, performing uh, judicial activities in many parts of the world. But uh, this has raised and is raising several challenges to which I will mention two or three of them. One of them is that the, uh, digi the digital gap, the digital divide, hmm? not only uh, in very few countries, uh, not only uh, the society as a whole, but even judges and lawyers uh, have no proper access to digital technology or they don't know how to handle it properly. And of course, this is creating a new gap between the society and the access to, to justice that, of course, generates another source of, of, of stress, how to handle these new guys which appear, appear through, the, in, through the internet. Then, a major challenge as well, because all the more accessible sources like Zoom and others are not the best uh, instruments to handle properly uh, according to due process rules. For instance, an audience and a hearing in which eventually uh, the client may, may need to have a private conversation with his or her lawyer. That is a major challenge in which it is obvious that the prevailing accessible uh, free uh, um, instruments are not the, the most appropriate so to, so to fit with uh, the needs of the judiciary. So I think that among many other aspects, these uh, digital responses that will, will uh, uh, has, have arrived to stay in most uh, situations uh, generate a new source of uh, stress because many people don't have a computer in their home, many people don't know how to use this, and of course in most countries, especially in rural areas, uh, the access to uh, to internet is very poor or uh, completely zero. So many things uh, should continue to be handled, and I guess that uh, in the future steps, that this kind of coordination, the, the way in which the Global Judiciary Integrity Network could uh, help with ideas, with clues, with suggestions, would be important so that uh, not only governments, the judiciary, uh, judiciary, and even the private sector, because they will need major investments so to uh, solve this uh, digital divide. I hope that in, in this in this uh, process, this uh, network, which which is absolutely fantastic, will continue to be as effective as, as it has been. And thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. Muchas gracias. Uh, for sharing with us your experience and the work of the Office of the Special Rapporteur. Uh, I'm sure it has been of great interest to the public and very useful to think of future options, also how to overcome these challenges. Uh, the first step is obviously to identify the challenges so then uh, all of us can work on, on solutions uh, for them. And also, uh, thank you for raising the issue of the, also the judges that have passed away uh, during this period, uh, either because of the effects of the pandemic, because of the COVID-19 virus, or because of acts of violence uh, against judges in the period. Uh, our sentiments as well to their families, to their colleagues. Uh, it's definitely the type of additional stress that we would not like to see judges going through, especially at this moment. So uh, now we'll move to the second round of questions for our panelists. And as we have seen during this event, there is a real opportunity to advance this discussion, exchange experiences and learn from those jurisdictions that are already providing well-being support for their judges. Now I would like to invite all the panelists to share with us what they see as some of the most recent challenges in this area, uh, including uh, because of the, the global pandemic, and what the judiciary and initiatives like the Global Judicial Integrity Network should and could do to address them. So to start, maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Carly and, and Sally to, to begin. Sure, thank you, Roberta. Um, I don't think either of the challenges that I'm that I want to mention are particularly recent, um, although they are probably exacerbated under pre present conditions. Having worked um, in the space of judicial well-being for some years now, and being at the tail end of a PhD on the topic, I really am just left with two big, I guess, chestnuts to try and crack uh, on this issue. 
The first is, I think, workload. Um, there, there comes a point where it doesn't matter what you try and do around the edges. If workload is oppressive, unrelenting and unmanageable, um, well-being will always suffer. There is nothing that can be done educationally or organisationally to, to manage that. And I think that's, that's a particular issue for the high volume courts, as I mentioned before. And it's one that, you know, without government support, it's pretty hard for the courts to deal with. But I, I do think it has to be said. Workload is an issue for almost every judicial officer that I've spoken to. Secondly, I think um, creating a culture where judges can speak authentically and openly about the human dimension of their work is really, really critical to creating a community of, of care and practice among judicial officers where wellbeing can thrive. Uh, and I agree with uh, what Judge Munch said and also Justice Gerti that um, judicial education is a great way to begin to, to create uh, the opportunity and environment for those kinds of conversations, those authentic conversations where behind closed doors, judges can be real with each other. Uh, I think uh, beautifully said, Carly. I, I was thinking about workload as being an absolutely critical issue at the moment and particularly in light of backlogs and we hear um, judges in a, in Victoria talking about the tsunami of work that that they feel coming down upon them. So that was in the front of my mind. Um, I think uh, you know I'm turning my attention to you know what what can be done. What's what the second part of the question? The sort of what can be done to support the judiciary and. Um, I think some of the, the creative things that I've seen happening recently have been about establishing some of those communities of practice. And we have trialled some new things in Australia um, that uh, like a small group discussions between judges. So creating a safe facilitated peer support space where people are able to come together and talk not only about um, the the content of the work and the, the kind of work people are doing, but actually the experience of being a judge. And I think um, taking small amounts of time regularly to do that with trusted colleagues is is an important strategy that we need to think about. Thank you so much, uh, Justice uh, Munch. Maybe you would like to be the next one. Yes, uh, well, I, I agree that isolation is, um, um, sorry, I agree that the workload is a very big problem, but I would like to add isolation. In Brazil, I think particularly, we, it's a very big country. I think Australia must have uh, the same characteristics, and there are many countryside, uh, smaller towns where the judges are completely alone. Sometimes they are even young people who have difficulties to build relationships, uh, even to find partners because the whole city is looking at them, you know, they are the judge. So this restrains a lot their contact with their families, um, their relationships. And I think this is a very big problem. But I, I agree with Carly that creating a culture where judges can really talk about themselves as human beings is a very important, um, it's a very important uh, thing to think about, yeah, to put in place. We have to understand that before anything, we are people. And I think that and I, we really have some of these experiences already in Brazil. I'm not going to talk about them because, of course, because of the time. But if you want to know more, um, we can talk about this in, an, in another opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Justice uh, Gertie. Maybe you can be the next. <laughs> yeah, happy to do that. Um, this is perhaps going to be very startling news for a lot of people listening. But yes, most judges are human beings. So yeah. I just let that settle. Um, that means, of course, that all of the usual strategies work for us. Of course they do. And I have to mention it. I know it's not a recent strategy, but I have to mention sleep. It's your number one priority. You must sleep before you even look at your workload. You have to get a night's sleep. It's crucial. Uh, so sleep, exercise and communications, as they do for everybody else, are absolutely crucial. But if I was to pick a recent strategy, and again, you may not believe this because for someone as young looking and handsome as I am, it's it's really, really important for me to turn off the camera to hide the self view 
it's exhausting to sit in court and look at yourself talking to yourself. It's really, really tiring. Even if you like what you see, it's still tiring. It's not natural. Turn it off if you can. Um, and that's a little that'll give you just a little bit more energy for what's going on uh, on the rest of the screen. Um, another recent strategy, which I learned from a, a colleague uh, in England, again, keeping the contact open with someone else has, has, has taught me this. He asked, when was the last time you did something that you really enjoyed? And I realized as I was trying to think, it's a, I have a bit of a, a weakness for 1980s power ballads. Um, and I realized I had not gone walking with my music on in my ears. I'd gone with friends for walks because we were allowed to do that within restrictions, but I hadn't gone out just to listen to music for a long time. And as soon as we had that conversation, he, of course, chose Wagner. And I just let that sit there. But that was an English judge. So and there may be many listening and good luck to you all. But uh, yeah, for me, it was something a lot less, a lot less terrifying. So pick something you haven't done for ages um, and that really makes you laugh or makes you happy and do it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very good advice and, and definitely for everyone, uh, especially the one about turning off the camera. Uh, there are recent studies already about this, not only the fatigue of the virtual meetings, but also the fatigue of watching yourself in virtual uh, meetings for so long. Uh, then Diego, uh, would you like to wrap up this uh, last portion of our panel? Uh, thank, you. thank you, Roberto. And unfortunately, it seems that the, the, the camera in my case is not uh, working. I see it on, but uh, something is happening in the cyberspace, which is that, that part of the problem we have uh, to face. Huh? Judges and lawyers around the world right now have, have to assist to hearings and follow cases, in many cases, without the, the, the proper logistical uh, resources. And, and, and let me, Roberta, return to what is my... my my role on no? the independence of the of the judiciary, hands off uh, the function of lawyers. Of course, more financial resources is needed, uh, reader, uh, good assistance and, 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 and also to uh, solve this uh, gap, uh, digital uh, divide. But uh, instead of trying to reduce uh, the independence of the of judges in, in, in the world as it's happening in several cases, the Supreme Court of El Salvador has been completely dismissed following an, an excess of, uh, uh, the, of the use of political power in El Salvador a couple of days uh, ago. As you mentioned, Roberta, several uh, judges and prosecutors are being harassed and killed in, 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 in some countries. The uh, Philippines is one of them. More than 50 uh, lawyers and judges have, have been killed there. So I think a, a, a major a structural thing is hands off the judiciary, re respect the independence of the judges. They are different from the government, different from the, the de facto economical or criminal uh, powers. And of course, I am sure that will be a, a relief for uh, uh, most uh, uh, areas of the world in which this permanent threat is, of course, a major source of uh, stress that affects not only uh, the judges directly involved, but society as a whole who has the right of a free and independent judiciary that decides following law, following precise rules and not pressures of anybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diego. Um, that's very uh, to the point also about linking this to independence of judges and all the external pressures uh, the additional external pressures uh, to the judges during the pandemic. Uh, I think it also links back to, uh, in particular, Justice Munch's point about judges being human beings. Uh, and sometimes uh, society uh, might not uh, remember this when they also have their own issues that they would like the judiciary to solve at a very speedy, quickly manner, because every problem that a person has is a priority for them, but also understanding that on the other side uh, is another human being with their own challenges uh, at this moment. I think that's also uh, a point that I hope that this conversation here and the work of the Global Judicial Integrity Network helps uh, raise awareness about uh, and remind people uh, of what 
really delivering justice uh, is about. So thank you very much to all of our panelists for this very interesting session. Uh, I hope uh, there is room in the future steps of the network to organize many other meetings with all of you. As I mentioned, uh, you're never going to get rid of the network uh, after this session. So the network will continue to engage you uh, in various other activities. Uh, I think we still have time for some of the questions from our audience. Uh, I can see that there was a lot of interest uh, uh, to the experiences that you all shared. Uh, so maybe we can do a couple of questions. I understand that uh, Diego uh, might not be able to join us until the end of the session. So Diego, in your case, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us and for always supporting the network uh, as you've been doing since the early stages of establishing the initiative and later as a member of the advisory board. Thank you very much for your work uh, and your uh, really service to the causes of judicial integrity and independence. So uh, I think now we have a now a female panel, which is also not something very common, uh, in, especially in, 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 in webinars. So uh, let's continue with uh, a few questions. I will start uh, maybe uh, again, there is a specific interest uh, on the Australian uh, experience, uh, and this is something that might also be helpful for other judiciaries. So maybe either uh, Carly uh, or Sally, uh, whoever would like to take the question is, could you clarify the extent to which the Australian offer of support to judges is mandatory uh, for the judges to participate or if it's optional? So if you can give a bit more uh, information on that. Yes, thank you. I saw that question. That's it's a great question and it's all voluntary. So um, I guess it goes to that idea of a mutual responsibility and we in Victoria, it's the responsibility of the courts to make um, these supports available and to absolutely create no barriers to people being able to access the support, but it's not mandated that judicial officers have to take it up. So the individual responsibility is to take up the offer and the court's responsibility is to provide a really great service. Thank you. And I think that that's a very interesting point as well, because we also don't want that the measures that the judiciary adopts become another source of of anxiety for the judges, right? So if they feel that they are forced to talk about their feelings, that might be even a bigger problem than uh, absolutely. The assistance. Yeah. Yes, and I think um, as we've said, judges are, are humans too, and usually being mandated to talk to a psychologist is a good way to um, invite defensiveness. So <laughs> we don't want to force anyone to talk to us. <laughs> I can just yeah, add yeah. one small um, one small. Uh, anecdote in addition to what Sally said, in a couple of the high volume courts in Victoria, um, accessing the proactive debriefing that Sally mentioned has been incentivised uh, in this way. So magistrates or coroners are um, invited to, to take up four sessions a year. If they go to their, their session with the mental health professional, they get the rest of the day in chambers out of court to do whatever might need to be done for themselves and their wellbeing. If they choose not to take it up, then they are in court as normal. And that I think has had the effect of encouraging near universal participation in those courts. No, that's, that's also a very good practice. So maybe now a question to all of the panelists. So whoever wants to, uh, to respond, uh, maybe raise the hand. So would you recommend any specific resources, videos, documents, etc.? that judges can benefit from on this topic of judicial well-being? Uh, well, I, I can take that one. Um, I We might be able to share perhaps in the chat or send it to you, Roberta and, and Christina. We have a judicial well-being part of our website and that has a range of different resources, articles, specific um, tools that we've written during the pandemic. So we've adapted and written um, strategies that people can access. We have podcasts. Um, it's sort of a, a curated hub for judicial wellbeing. So we'd be happy to share that with you and um, 
you're very welcome to look at it. Thank you. Thank you others, so much. Others may well have other you. ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Justice Gertie. Yeah, thank you so much, Roberta. Yeah, I just wanted to. Well, I, I think say two things. One is that again, because judges are the same as everyone else, different things will work for different people, obviously. So I love the idea of Sally and Carly having an institutional uh, response to that. And indeed, the uh, your organization, Roberta, hopefully will help us with that as well. But individually, what I find has helped me, it won't work for everyone, but what has helped me is uh, mindfulness practices which I never took up um, until very late. As you know, as I've mentioned, I'm in my late 70s, so I really only took this up in my 50s. OK, I'm obviously joking at this stage, but I, I really it was something I had no time for for most of my life. And I'm really sorry I didn't um, I didn't take to it a little bit earlier. It did me no harm to give up smoking. I just let that sit there did me no harm. And um, the last thing I must say is that it is just half past one here in Ireland and I have been invited to come and get my vaccination in about an hour's time. So I have to leave because obviously I'm really, really excited about that. So um, I, I wanted to just take this opportunity to say thank you and um, how much I enjoyed the, the session today and apologies because I'd love to stay and chat for longer, but I absolutely am not going to miss that appointment this afternoon. <laughs> No, definitely, definitely. And please, please go. Thank you. <laughs> On Thanks, behalf Bridget. of all of us waiting for our vaccines, please go. <laughs> and, and thank you very much for uh, for your participation. Yeah. So lovely it's to meet you all. Real thank, pleasure. You. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. So uh, maybe also on that note, and as we are approaching the, the end of our uh, our session. Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Justice uh, Munch if you would like to add any any points about the discussion or additional experiences from Brazil before we conclude. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I would I would just briefly speak about an experience that we are having at the fourth region. We have put with the help of many people. We have innovate. It has been developed by an innovation laboratory. And we have put into place a program that is called Pertencer, which means belonging. But we made a word game in Brazil because uh, we wrote it with an S. It, the correct word would be with a C. And we write it with an S, which, which makes a word game between belonging and being. Because you have to be to be able to belong. First of all, you have to take care of yourself. And it has been, um, we have developed a different um, paths, which is also voluntary for, for judges, and it's independent of the, 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 psych, uh, the, the, the psychology department or everything. It's more an institutional program and to, to, to allow people to engage in different paths of uh, self-development. We have small challenges and also of uh, social responsibility, environmental responsibility, so that they can uh, begin integrating other dimensions to their work and the objective in this program was to recover the purpose and meaning and, and really the sense of belonging and this has been really important during the pandemic because we have even uh, put into place a, a Facebook page with all um, people that work for, for the federal justice uh, of the fourth region whoever wanted to enter could enter and people could communicate we have WhatsApp we have WhatsApp lists where we don't talk about work where we talk about people about our human dimension so just briefly um, it has been it's it's a it's a, not a very long experience but uh, we have with through this program tried to really uh, as Carly said, develop a culture where people, where the judges can see themselves as human, where they can bring all the other aspects of their, of them as human, as human beings of their lives, uh, to, to the colleagues, to the table, to their institution, and and the, it's a way of saying we know that you're human beings, and we want you to be human beings and to bring what you really are, to integrate what you really are, and we are interested in knowing who you really are. So this is just, um, yeah, briefly about this experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Muito obrigada. <laughs> obrigada. Uh, <thank> you. <laughs> and uh, I also uh, maybe invite you, uh, Justice Munch, uh, if you would like to also share these experiences 
by writing an article for the website of the Global Judicial Integrity Network, Sally and Carly as well, uh, if you would like to share further the experiences of the uh, judiciary of Victoria in Australia, please uh, also, you're also invited to uh, write an article for our website. Uh, the video of this uh, webinar will also be made available on the website of the Global Judicial Integrity Network, hopefully as an additional resource uh, for judges everywhere. Uh, I don't know, Carly and Sally, if you would like to also say uh, some final words before we conclude. Uh, just for my part, Roberta, this has been a, an immense pleasure and a real privilege to be part of this international conversation on this really important topic. And I look forward to being able to continue the connections and the conversation with some of the people that we've met tonight. Yes, thank you so much. And I, I'm just left feeling very humbled listening to the experiences of judges around the world and many who are dealing with stressors that we we haven't um, encountered in our work so far and reading the reading the comments in the chat and listening to some of you i i feel really moved with what has been said and just really appreciate that um people have have spoken as much as, as they have and thank you so much for for talking with us thank you thank you so much to both of you uh especially since it's so late in the evening uh, for you at this moment uh, uh, and you're here sharing with us uh, all the experience. Uh, this was truly a humbling uh, discussion, a, a humbling uh, mm -hmm. webinar uh, that shows that there is room for a lot more to be done. And hopefully this is the start of a very long journey. Uh, again, I'll go back to uh, Justice Gertie's uh, point about choosing your traveling companions. The network is definitely uh, open to be one of these companions uh, to link all the efforts uh, all over the world. And uh, we look forward to your participation, your guidance uh, in this process. So we'll now conclude our session. Uh, and I would just like to say that uh, the issues of uh, judicial well-being and its implications for access to justice and judicial integrity, as we have seen, are really a timely topic, uh, not only because of the global pandemic, but because it's really time that mental health is also at the forefront of the, the, the concerns about how judicial integrity and ethics and independence, impartiality affect the access to justice and various other human rights. So this webinar provided us with a unique opportunity to advance this debate. These inputs will certainly help the network develop new tools and materials to continue helping judges. And we look forward to continue to work with you uh, on this and various other topics related to judicial integrity. So again, thank you very much, our dear speakers, for being with us today to share these interesting experiences and good judicial practices and also the humor that we had today in this session. Many thanks to everyone who joined us today from around the world in this webinar of the Global Judicial Integrity Network. And to everyone, please stay tuned for the next activities of the network. Do not forget to visit the website to learn more about the work on this topic and many other judicial integrity issues. And thank you again. This is the end of another webinar of the Global Judicial Integrity Network. Thank you very much. And we now conclude this meeting. Thank you.